recording this conference off. will now be recorded okay excellent all right guys well here we are another friday um as you guys know it's so, okay so today is is gonna be <laughs> i'm gonna have to try to go through some of these slides pretty quickly um because it's a lot of information to cover okay um so we're going to go ahead and get started. Please make sure that you're muting yourselves. OK. All right, let's see if this will advance. I always struggle. OK, so um, again, we're today we're just covering tuberculosis. So for those of you who missed last week, um, we briefly talked about SPICE and some of the education that the, that North Carolina had put out. And so again, I just wanted to reiterate that this is a, there's other classes on this network as well. So when you log in, you can do this high level disinfection for the infection preventionist course. And it's, and it's excellent. Um, it's gonna really help you understand sterile processing. And so please make sure that you're giving it a, that you're giving it a try, that you're logging in, that you're looking at all of the other classes that they're also offering because they definitely have a lot to offer. Okay, so today we're on week 3.5. <laughs> um, so I've, I've had to tell myself that I need to stop extending the study group. You know, I, I just need, the pro, here's the problem. The problem is that there's so much information that is important for this test and, and that, that you need to know for the exam that I'm not entirely sure how to cover all of it. And so what ends up happening is that with every cohort, I end up, you know, identifying some areas where it's like, oh, we need to do a bit of a deeper dive here. We need to do a bit of a deeper dive there. And then this is how we end up with week 3.5. And we had week 2.5. And um, because we have to keep adding content to, to the study group, essentially. One of the thoughts that I've had is, well, maybe since we've got so many recordings of past of past study groups, then maybe I could do different chapters. The problem with that is that it doesn't change the fact that there are some chapters that are just extremely, extremely important and that you have to read to pass this test. Um, and that's where I kind of get into a, into a situation. So today we're gonna be talking about um, tuberculosis. We don't really have time to talk about other mycobacteria. And we briefly covered some, some of the mycobacteria in one of our previous um, meetings. Okay, so who knew that George Orwell died of tuberculosis? Well, I knew this, but this this is something that I found out when <laughs> back when I was um, initially, you know, learning about tuberculosis and TB. And so, I think it's important to find ways to make this information relevant, to make the information stick, to find ways to remember, you know, really key facts about uh, about this, about this disease. Um, and so he wrote his last novel, uh, 1984, at his friend's house in Scotland. And this is some of the, you know, symptoms that, that he described, which is fever, weight loss, and night sweats, which sent him into the hospital where he underwent collapse therapy, which is a treatment designed to close the dangerous cavities that form in the chest of tuberculosis patients. And he was uh, diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1947. So it's important to mention that collapse, um, collapse therapy aimed to close tuberculosis cavities and cavity formation is the most ominous event in the pathogenesis of tuberculosis. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it was, it's just, it's intense, it's intense. So there's this, um, there's this passage that he wrote. So, and this is in regards to the treatment that he was undergoing. So he, he states, the treatment they are giving me is to put the left lung out of action, apparently for about six months, which is supposed to give it a better chance to heal. They first crushed the phrenic nerve, which I gather is what makes the lung expand and contract, and then pumped air into actually under the diaphragm, which I understand is to push the lung into a different position. I have to get refills, quote unquote, of air, but later it gets down to once a week. So very intense. Uh, there's an entire, you know, uh, Smithsonian article that you can read about George Orwell and tuberculosis. 
So a little bit of the background of TB. So the highest incidence of active tuberculosis occurs in Africa with about 363 cases per 100,000 and Asia of 180 cases per 100,000. This is all based off data from 2006. Um, and I think it's important to note that there has been, you know, there's obviously always research that's being published, always new papers that are coming out. But like I always tell you, when you're preparing for this test, try to be mindful. You can use, um, you can use other resources to to gather information and to learn, but try to remember that the test is being primarily pulled from some of those very key resources. So the APIC text is number one. So all of this information is from the APIC text and CDC is number two. So the, you know, the, the information, this data being used from 2006 lines up with our guidelines for preventing the transmission of mycobacterium tuberculosis in healthcare settings, which, which, which were published in 2005 by CDC. So keep all of this in mind. TB rates rose in the United States from 9.3 cases per 100,000 in 1985 to 10.5 cases per 100,000 in 1992. So for those of you who read the text, why did we see this increase um, in our TB cases between those years? They highlight this in the, in the text. Let me check the chat. Rachel, I was a TB nurse. I love the topic. Okay. <laughs> um, what was going on around that time? 1985, 1992. HIV. Great job, Rachel. Yeah. So one of the things that you're going to notice when you're reading through the text is that they do point out um, chronic conditions that can affect um, the likelihood of you acquiring TB or progressing into, you know, active TB, et cetera. So they they really they really make sure that you understand that there's a correlation between some of these chronic conditions and our tuberculosis patients. So yeah, she's correct. Um, it was our HIV epidemic, everything that was going on at that time. Um, there they also cite multiple you know issues that were happening just within that time frame in different cities they talk about new york and housing crisis and homeless population and all of these issues that were happening at a very at that very you know in that time frame that contributed to the rise in the tb cases by 1994 20 healthcare personnel had acquired multi-drug resistant tuberculosis uh, and 45 percent of them died and so it's really <laughs> It's really important to understand the implications of TB in healthcare. And basically, um, in the chapter, when you get to the portion which is like infection prevention, it's all talking about just how difficult this disease is to diagnose and to, um, to ensure that you're keeping it at the forefront, especially now. I mean, we personally, me personally, I don't very often deal with TB patients. Um, it's every once in a while, a couple cases per year, um, you know, two, three, four potentially um, suspected TB cases that come through the hospital. And so it's not, it's not something that we're constantly dealing with. And so with that lack of familiarity, you're going to experience different barriers at ensuring your um, you're doing all of the right steps. And so TB is very, very tricky. And it's one that I highly rely on my infectious disease physicians um, to work alongside with. And they're at the end of the day, there are clinicians and they're the ones working with the differentials and trying to come up with their diagnoses. And then also the health department. Um, we have to work closely with the health department to make sure that we're providing them with the information that they need. And they also work closely with us to notify us of patients who may be coming through our hospital. Um, just this year, I got a call from the health department that was like, hey, one of our patients who's under direct observe therapy is at your facility. And if they're admitted, this is the regimen that they're on. And I had to go over to the pharmacy and I'm like, hey, do we have this? Do we have these medications available? So it's important to have that partnership and that collaboration. So 2011, the TB rate was 3.4 per 100,000. So we've obviously seen a significant decrease. Uh, Julia says that her local Department of Health has an excellent TB control nurse, and she's a wonderful resource. They are. They are. And the thing is that this is all their, this is it. This is the world that they live in. And so it's important to, you know, trust their guidance and what, 
and what they're telling you because as an IP, right, you're dealing with so many different diseases, so many different issues, problems, fires that you're putting out on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're not, you know, very well versed in TB, which it's it's not an easy disease to know inside and out. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of just, I, I, there's so much. I'm sure that just reading the chapter alone, you guys are probably like, okay, wait, what? There is so much information here to to absorb and to try to understand that it's good to have those resources where you can, hey, I want to run this case by you. What do you think? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so why have we experienced this decrease? So implementation of expanded treatment regimens, increasing coverage of direct observed therapy, including involuntary detention and administration of therapy when needed, and implementation of CDC recommended infection control recommendations. And so direct observed therapy is really key to good management of, of tuberculosis because you need to make sure that people are in for you can be treated for months and months and months and months on medications for months and months and months. And so having that that resource available, you know, working with the health department for that direct observed therapy is extremely important because it's ensuring that patients are actually staying on top of their medications. They're taking them that when, when they need to because the problem is they'll start feeling better and then they'll stop taking their medication. Uh, so six is extensively drug resistant, so extremely drug resistant TB is defined as TB resistant to NIH, rifampin, any fluoroquinolone, and at least one of the injectable second line drugs such as amikacin, canamycin, or capriomycin, um, which were reported in 2011. So extremely drug resistant TB is very much real. Um, and so is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Okay. Tuberculosis and other mycobacteria. So M. tuberculosis is the causative agent of tuberculosis, which is an aerobic acid fast bacillus. People are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis primarily via inhalation, which is why our primary method of prevention when they're in the hospital is going to be placed to place them into airborne isolation. Uh, Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis strains have emerged in recent years and are more difficult to treat. And this is gonna definitely vary by region, location, uh, it's it's going to it's definitely going to be a lot of understanding where you're finding it, where it's being seen, um, so you can see the distribution. When I was in graduate school, um, one of my professors had had very good connections with Ecuador and Peru, and he traveled a lot, you know, back and forth between the University of South Florida and South America to work on different projects, work on different papers. And I remember from his lectures of him showing us pictures of these extremely drug resistant tuberculosis rooms and all of the signage that would be on the doors and the ante rooms and just you know the pictures of of you know these patients in Peru and in other um you know in Ecuador and what what that and what that looked like and it was at the time I, I wasn't working as an infection preventionist and so I was like oh my goodness this is so intense um but it's it's a bit it's a bit different but even now you know we don't have signage similar to to what i saw in some of those pictures i mean it was like multiple like biohazard signs like bright yellow you know just very very intense um for those extremely drug resistant tuberculosis patients um and the non-tuberculous mycobacteria can cause a variety of diseases, including pulmonary, skin, and soft tissue infections, especially in our immunocompromised individuals. All right, so we're going to talk about the pathophysiology. So TB is usually transmitted through airborne particles, uh, usually one to five um, um, micro, micro, oh, I forgot in size that are generated by individuals with pulmonary and laryngeal TB and laryngeal TB is extremely infectious so you need to keep that in mind. Uh, when produced indoors, for example hospital rooms, these particles can be suspended in the air for prolonged periods of time and travel through the ventilation system of the building to infect susceptible individuals located in other areas. This is why one of the most important pieces of information that you need to have as an infection preventionist is you need to know the locations of your negative um, 
pressure rooms, your airborne isolation rooms in your hospital and in your facility. You need to know how many do I have per unit? What rooms are they in? Because especially with COVID, right? We've ran into some issues where, yes, we have to, you know, we have to wear our N95s, but with some of the numbers that we had uh, for our COVID patients, that we just did not have enough negative pressure rooms for all of these patients. So we resorted to other um, other methods, HEPA filters, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to our TB patients, this is the type of situation where you really want to make sure that um, you're trying to talk to your house supervisors, talk to the people who can move your patients around so that you can get those patients into a truly negative pressure airborne room as soon as possible, as soon as you're even suspecting it. Uh, the infectious droplet can go to the alveoli, be phagocytized by macrophages where MTB can survive, produce local infection, and in some cases disseminate. The mycobacteria first spread to the regional lymph nodes and subsequently get disseminated throughout the body. This is where we run into a lot of other issues with extra pulmonary TB. And um, <laughs> I, my infectious disease physician always says, well, you know, you can get TB anywhere. TB can be found in, in so many, you know, different locations and they're correct. When you read through the book, we're not going to touch on extra pulmonary TB because we don't have enough time. But when you read through your text, you're going to see that they're going to talk to you about extra pulmonary TB, TB in the meninges, TB in the spine, TB in the geno gen genital urinary tract. They're going to talk to you about all of these different places, skin infections where you can find mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, when it comes to extra pulmonary TB. And those are things that you should be familiar with because you may have patients who come in with extra pulmonary TB um, and you need to be able to talk to your ID physicians about it. Um, and there may be some of you who may not have an ID physician that, you know, is constantly rounding in the hospital. We've got two, you know, we've got two groups of infectious disease practices that round in our hospitals and they're here every day. <laughs> here every single day so it, it's great to have that resource resource for us yeah so julia said we had a patient with pots disease which is tb in the spine so you know you are going to see so many things when it comes to this and it's it's a rabbit hole there's so much that you can that you can learn about this disease uh okay so although the person may have some mild symptoms the initial infection usually goes unrecognized a lot of the times you know our patients are going to be once they're exposed to tb they'll be asymptomatic during this stage of initial infection the individual is not contagious unless active disease develops specific immunity develops in about 10 to 12 weeks and further spread of the organism is prevented and we'll talk a little bit about how our bodies are able to help prevent the spread of, um, of TB and kind of what our lungs do and our macrophages do to, to help with that. So within two to 12 weeks, this is important because your PPD, your purified protein derivative, um, or your skin test, your TST, it takes about two to 12 weeks for those to become positive. But infection may remain asymptomatic for several years. That's when we're getting into our latent TB infection, which may progress to active TB. Within two years of the initial infection, approximately 5% of the persons develop active TB because of a failure of the immune system to control the mycobacteria. And they really emphasize this in the text. They really make sure that you understand that those with chronic conditions, diabetes, um, uh, immunosuppression, all of these, all of the, they have an entire list. Um, it makes them more likely to progress and to develop active TB because it affects our immune system and our immune response in the way that we are able to combat TB once again into the lungs. So if no disease develops within this two-year period, the patient continues to have a low annual risk of reactivation. In general, the remaining risk is about 5 to 10% for a total lifetime risk of about 10 to 15%. So primary TB infection. So again, it's usually asymptomatic with a few patients developing fevers, cough, or erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum is a type of skin inflammation that is located in a part of the fatty layer of the skin. Um, it results in reddish, painful, tender lumps, most commonly located in the front of the legs below the knees. And the tender lumps or nodules range in size from a dime to about a quarter. I think some of these look a bit bigger than a quarter, but that's what they said. <laughs> and so, and so, this is one of the things that you would be that you would be looking for. 
Okay, so continuing with our primary TB infection. So radiological presentation can be variable, but the but the classic GON complex includes a primary focus of infection or infiltrate and lymphadenopathy on draining lymph nodes or in progressive cases, a miliary pattern can be reported. So this is where um, we learn a bit about our GON complex, which is gonna include our lungs and also our lymph, our lymph system. Because as we know, well, if you read your chapter, TB is an intracellular pathogen, so it actually lives inside our, our macrophages. It, it uses our macrophages to do what they need to do. And so when you look at your, um, uh, essentially, your GON disease, you're, you're looking at our encap like encapsulated uh, portions of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this is this is one of the right right here, this picture, the central caseous necrosis. So it looks a lot prettier in this drawing <laughs> than in some of the other ones. Um, but it's 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 essentially like encased in there. Um, dissemination during this primary TB infection can be controlled by the immune system, but multiple non-pulmonary sites of controlled infection can be established and can lead to extra pulmonary disease during post-primary TB reactivation. And this is why some of our patients who have immunosuppression may not be able to really activate their immune system the way they need to try to encapsulate tuberculosis once it gets into the lungs because our their immune system doesn't have the capacity to, to really mount that sort of a response. And so that's where they're getting in trouble. So our caseous necrosis, it's derived from the Latin word, which is cheese, cheese-like or pertaining to cheese. Um, and so it's a crucial phenomenon that happens within the caseous lesion. So the death of the majority, if not all, of the tubercular bacilli. There is a striking contrast between the high bacillary content of the lesions in which the caseation process is beginning and the limited number or lack of viable bacilli in old caseous fossae. So it's basically saying as you go through this process of encapsulation, the mycobacterium tuberculosis is essentially dying as these, you know, cheese-like that's how they're described and the pictures are really <laughs> disgusting, um, which is why I didn't put them on here. But yeah. Mm. So uh, the caseous necrosis is the basic process of tuberculosis disease in humans, and the interval from infection to tuberculin conversion is never more than eight weeks, and in general is five to seven weeks. So again, this is a unique form of cell death in which the tissue maintains a cheese-like appearance. It is also a distinctive form of coagulate coagulative necrosis, the dead tissue appears as a soft and white proteinaceous dead cell mass. And this is from a paper that I read, which was really trying to talk about um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it talked about specifically, you know, um, Arcaceous necrosis. So the host locally destroys its own tissue to control the uninhibited intracellular multiplication of bacilli that would otherwise be fatal. Although detrimental in essence, delayed, sorry, delayed type hypersensitivity or tissue damaging activity is therefore an integral part of the host defenses. During the process, the majority of tubercular bacilli are killed, while some survive extracellularly in the solid caseous material, but are unable to multiply because of the anoxic conditions, reduced pH, and the presence of numerous enzymes released from the dead cells. So, that's how they get got. So post-primary TB. Post-primary TB usually manifests with a productive cough, fevers, about 37 to 80%, and night sweats. So a lot of you in your hospitals have um, screening. Well, would you call them screening sheets? We, in our facility, we call them, it's called the PHH, which is the pertinent health history of a person. As they're coming in and they're getting triaged through the emergency department or when you're completing your admission, part of that paperwork that you complete on an incoming admission or a patient that's going to be brought into the unit or coming into the emergency department is you ask them some of these key questions about fevers, cough, weight loss, history of exposure to TB, being foreign born is also one of those questions. And in our facility, we have a, a matrix that essentially put places a score. So if a patient scores higher than five on their screening tool, 
then an alert gets generated on the chart that says, hey, this patient has essentially scored higher than five and should be placed on airborne isolation until TB can rule it out, or you need to discuss the potential of TB with the, with, the, with the provider. How many of you have a process similar to that in your hospitals, in your facilities? Some type of screening tool, some type of form that you review, some type of alert that gets linked back to infection prevention. Because we get notified of abnormal PHH results. It's part of one of our one of the the notification sheets that come in through our um, through our fax. We haven't transitioned to Epic yet, okay? So we're 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 transitioning to Epic. So hopefully we'll it'll be a different a bit of a different process. Okay, so some people are saying that you've got a TB protocol or that you have a respiratory screening protocol. Okay, so similar. We've got similarities. Anyways, this is this is one of the ways where we identify some of these potential TB patients, which is through those screening tools, and we're looking for similar, you know, symptoms as what's being described. So it's characterized by infiltrates located on the upper lobes or the superior segments of the lower lobes and is frequently associated with cavitation on our chest x-rays. Respiratory symptoms usually last more than two to three weeks, and this is really useful to help differentiate from other respiratory illnesses like flu. And cough may initially be non-productive, but subsequently followed by sputum production as tissue necrosis progresses. Pulmonary TB can be associated with hemoptysis. Our screening tool also includes hemoptysis, which may be small amounts if secondary to superficial erosion of the airway or massive amounts if it is the result of a rupture of a dilated vessel on the pulmonary cavity. Weight loss, chest pain, anorexia, malaise, and debilitation are additional things that you would be looking for. So when you are potentially concerned that a patient could have TB, one of the very first things that you're going to look at is your chest x-rays, their history, the screening tools that they completed, and you're gonna put all of that together for when you're gonna talk to your provider and your physicians about it. Now, co most commonly, there's two, there's two specialties that you're going to talk to. You're either gonna talk to infectious diseases, so the infectious disease group, physician, that's, you know, at your hospital or pulmonology. Those are the two most common, you know, specialists that we're talking to when it comes to TB. Hey, what are you thinking about this patient? This is the history. Um, sometimes our lung cancer patients trigger TB alerts because of the symptoms and some of the things that are, you know, the way that, that, that they present. And so it's really important to have good relationships with your providers to, to help determine what's the best course of action here. So post-primary TB and HIV patients. Patients with HIV and higher CD4 T cell counts may have the typical apical infiltrates of post-primary TB. In patients with HIV and low CD4 cell counts, the presentation of pulmonary TB may be atypical with a miliary pattern, lower lobe infiltrates, or even normal chest x-rays. And again, you have to remember that immunosuppression factor. So if their immune system is not able to mount a response, send those macrophages to the lungs, start to encapsulate it, cause that caseous necrosis. Are we going to see cavitations? Are we going to see some of the things that we usually see in our chest x-rays? No, we're, we're not. And so it's really important to keep that in mind when you're reviewing your charts and you're looking at that patient's history. It, it, you have to look at their, their past medical history, their chest x-rays, lab values, if they do a quantiferon, like what, you know, there are so many different things that you need to look at for these patients. And then the CD4 cell is the masterpiece of the immune response in tuberculosis, while the macrophage is the effector cell. So our acid fast bacteria, um, mycobacteria contain mycolic acid uh, in that waxy surface, which is impervious to chemicals or dyes. So some of our important pathogens are obviously going to be TB, leprosy, opportunistic wound, infect wound, wound infections, and they grow inside of our macrophages. This is from our previous lecture, so I'm not really going to go too much into it, but you have to remember that with our acid-fast bacilli, um, and specifically our, our mycobacteria, they're poorly gram-staining, gram um, gram-positive bacillus. It's not the way you want to go for these pathogens. You want to do use your acid 
fast stains, which one of them is going to be the Zeal Nielsen um, acid fast stain, which we're not really going to cover here. But remember, Kenyon or Seal, Seal Nielsen, most commonly I see them referring to the Seal Nielsen, um, uh, the name. And this, this part here, this last bullet point is really important because what I have found is that they will often try to make sure that you know different organisms that that can get pulled into acid fast staining. So they want to make sure that, hey, do you as an infection preventionist know that Nocardia and Rhodococcus and Legionella, this, this specific one, can also stain, um, you know, have these acid fast stains under some conditions? Because that is extremely important. I remember one of the one of the questions that is in the practice in the practice test um, is specifically asking like, oh, why would you not place this patient under under isolation? And one of the answer choices is um, the patient um, has a positive test for nocardia species or something along those lines and along those lines and it's, and that's where you really have to pull all of this information. There's so much that you need to know, but it's okay. Just take it one chapter at a time, make sure that you review the information and that you do lots and lots and lots of practice questions. All right, let's talk about our laboratory methods. So MTB can be cultured in special broth media or on solid media. Although traditionally considered to be slow growing, use of modern broth culture methods allows the organism to be recovered in as little, in as, little as a few days. Likewise, species identification, which has traditionally required slow biomechanical tests, has been improved with the introduction of molecular biological techniques. So deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA probe, and, polymer and polymerase chain reaction, PCR-based technologies, can often provide definitive species identification on the same day that growth of the organism has been confirmed. Um, so the you know the problem with this is you still you still have to grow the organism and so if they're a slow grower you may not be able to do that um, DNA probe until you have that specimen that you can actually test. Two nucleic acid amplification tests have been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to identify MTB and respiratory specimens even before a specimen smear is AFB positive, and these tests allow for rapid identification of MTB, but an AFB culture is still required for definitive diagnosis. You have to remember how important your cultures are for diagnosing mycobacterium tuberculosis. You have to remember cultures, 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 cultures. Don't let them trick you on this test. So TB culture. This is a close view of a mycobacterium tuberculosis culture, revealing this organism's colonial, colonial morphology. Note the relatively colorless rough surface, which are typical morphologic characteristics seen in mycobacterium tuberculosis colonial growth. It looks really interesting. So now you know. Now you know. These are from the CDC. So I have personally never seen TB grow in a culture, but I am sure some of you on the call have. So I have to go based off my resources, <laughs> my my uh, handy dandy CDC public health um, image library to show me what what these look like um, in real life. So hopefully they look similar to what you would see in the lab. Um, so TB culture continues. Um, <laughs> okay, we have somebody from the lab that says, <laughs> TB colonial growth looks like chips. <laughs> okay, so I need more lab friends because last time Pseudomonas smelled like grapes. <laughs> now TB looks like chips. Like you guys have a thing for food descriptions, and I, <laughs> um, yeah, I need more lab. I need more lab people in my life. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw that out there. Um, applications are open for for lab friends. <laughs> okay, so TB culture continued. Um, so although DNA technologies are extremely helpful in speeding the diagnosis of TB, cultures will still be required for the foreseeable future because identification of antimicrobial sensitivities requires growth of the organism. Absolutely true. Susceptibility testing should be done on an initial isolate from every patient with newly diagnosed TB. Likewise, susceptibility testing should be done if the patient remains culture positive after three months of treatment. And one of the things that they'll tell you is that, you know, once you're on treatment, you should be having sputum, sputum samples done at least once every month. And it was interesting because with this last case of 
TB that came through the hospital, I got a call from the health department and I was telling you guys about this, but they were like, hey, one of our patients who's, you know, currently undergoing treatment is, you know, at your facility. If they get admitted, this is what they're going to need. This is a, this is the treatment regimen that they're on. Let me send this over to you. And then they also they also were like they have had multiple negative sputum cultures in the past m couple months, and they sent that as well. And so, and I remember I was like initially, you know, I was talking to one of the nurses who was taking care of the patient, and the nurse is from Brazil, and she was just like oh yeah I'm from Brazil she was like you know we, we deal with tuberculosis all of the time and she was talking to me she was telling me stories about Brazil and TB and just how extremely comfortable she felt with dealing with the disease and it, it, it's like it, it's just like very 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 normalized in Brazil um, and I I I was just fascinated just hearing her tell me the stories of you know the work that she did She's obviously a nurse and um, I don't know, it was just, it, I ended up having such a wonderful conversation with our, you know, with our frontline staff about this. Um, and it was all because the the health department called, let me know what was going on. I was able to get in touch with the pharmacy. So again, you have to have these uh, these relationships established so that they know who to call, who to talk to. Uh, she was familiar with the, you know, with the treatments and it, it was just, I don't think that this patient could have gotten a better nurse to be paired up with because she was she was on it she knew her stuff um in public health almost everyone i know that works in tv has had positive tst and have had nine months of inh or rifampin okay so that's from rachel so there you go public health again public health is amazing but we know this so susceptibility again cdc public health image library shout out to the people these th Thin agar culture plates reveal the results of a drug susceptibility test on mycobacterium tuberculosis. In tests like this, the agar medium is imbibed with various drugs to determine which medications the bacteria are susceptible. Though in this case it is not known what drugs were being tested, it is apparent that each had a different effect on the organism's survival. And you can see where you've got your growth. I'm not seeing chips, but you know what? I'm I'm choosing I'm choosing to trust here <laughs> that if I was at the lab, I would see chips. <laughs> okay, let's talk about our uh, tuberculin skin test. Are we making good time? Oh, we're not making good time. Okay, tuberculin skin test. So the TST involves injection of purified protein. Um, derived from the mycobacterial cell wall. This test relies on the fact that persons who have been infected with TB will have a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction to this reagent. The TST is a screening tool to detect people with um, latent TB. It cannot be used for ruling in or ruling out active TB, and that's because it doesn't, it doesn't tell you whether you have active infection. This is because a positive TST merely indicates a history of LTB at some point in the past. It conveys no information regarding the current status of the person's infection, which may even have been cured previously. Likewise, a negative test does not rule out active TB because people with active TB may well have a negative TST, even in the presence of positive controls. And again, we have that delay, that delay period we can take two to you know two plus weeks before you can have that that conversion and that TST uh, you know showing up as positive. So yes, lots of lots of different issues. So the Mantu method is the preferred way to perform the TST, uh, which is uh, using a tuberculin syringe that's used to inject five tuberculin units of PPD intradermally, which is purified protein derivative. The test is generally placed on the volar or palmar surface of the forearm, but it may be but it may be placed on the dorsal surface if necessary. A properly placed test raises a small wheel at the site of injection, and then the TST is read about 48 to 72 hours after placement. A positive test is determined by the number of millimeters of induration, not erythema. And I remember this so clearly. <laughs> um, sorry, people are messaging. Um, I remember this so clearly. Okay, so picture this loose is like 16 years old. Maybe I was 17. No, I was definitely 16. And I'm about to volunteer at the hospital for the first time. And I'm just like, all right, we're doing this thing. Filling out my little paperwork, go to my little orientation, do my thing. 
And I remember one of the things that I had to do to volunteer at the hospital was they had to do this skin test, this TST test. And, and um, I go, you know, get my little test. They do the little thing and they're like, oh, you have to come back, blah, blah, blah. I go back and I remember the nurse closed her eyes, asked me to extend out my arm and she closed her eyes and she was just rubbing over the area. Like she wasn't even looking at it. She was just like feeling and she was like, oh, I have to do that because I need to make sure that it's all by, you know, by I'm looking for the bump. And I was like, oh, OK. All right. Well, that's great. Um, glad that we got to do this. But yeah. So again, they're not looking. You're not measuring by erythema. You're measuring by induration. And this is an image of that Mantu tuberculin skin test. This tells you everything that you need to do. Needle bevel slowly at five to 15 degree angle. Let me tell you something, Luce is not a nurse. Luce will not be doing this. Um, but to my friends who are part of employee health, some of you may be uh, dual roles where you're employee health and your infection prevention, you know, just hit pause on the recording and read through that whole situation there. Okay, interpretation of the TST. It is important to note that the actual number of millimeters of induration we're recording a TST result and not just negative or positive. Yes, 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 yes you may have questions regarding the actual induration and how many millimeters. So remember this, this is important. This is important. You can't just put positive or negative. You have to document the millimeters because new information about the patient may change the interpretation of the test. What if that millimeter is larger the second time that you do it? There's, or is it, what if it's smaller? You have to, you have to write down the millimeter size, do not forget. In addition, for persons receiving serial TSTs, the exact size is important in interpretation of subsequent tests. A test is considered a conversion, that is a change from negative to positive, if there is an increase in the amount of induration by 10 millimeters compared with the previous test. This is why you can't just say, oh, it's positive, oh, it's negative. No, 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 mm -mm, mm -mm. Hit the brakes, you're going 60 and a 30, you need to make sure you write your millimeters. Okay, TST induration. Criteria for positive man to tuberculin test reactions. So greater than or equal to five millimeters. It's gonna be considered positive, right? So this is criteria, criteria, criteria for positive man to tuberculin test reactions. Greater, greater than or equal to five millimeters, HIV positive persons, recent contacts of a TB case, fibrotic changes on a chest X-ray consistent with old TB, and patients with organ transplants and other immunosuppressed patients. Okay, 10 millimeters. Recent arrivals, less than five years from high prevalence countries. IV drug users who are HIV negative, residents, employees of high risk congregate settings like healthcare facilities, prisons, shelters, et cetera. Mycobacteriology lab personnel. That's also another thing. We don't have enough time to cover it, but yes, this this could potentially be a problem in the lab. You know what? We should have an entire we should have an entire outbreak, outbreak related lecture. Like let's just go one day through all of these. No, we don't have enough time in life. But anyway, yes, outbreaks, papers. You can go read them. Lots of papers on outbreaks. Uh, persons with high risk clinical conditions, such as chronic renal failure, uh, silicosis, gastrectomy, malnutrition, medically underserved high risk minorities, and children less than four years of age or infants and children exposed to adults in high risk categories. And then the very last category, which is greater than or equal to 15 millimeters, persons with no risk factors for TB. You got to know this chart. You have to know this chart. I said it here so that you remember it. You got to review this chart. IGRAs are IGRAs or interferon gamma release assays. So in 2001, the FDA, the FDA approved the first IGRA, but it was, or IGRA, but it was less, speci less specific than the TST. More recently, new IGRAs are more specific that are more specific have been developed. They evaluate the release of interferon gamma from the host cell when exposed to TB proteins, such as the early secretory antigenic target, ESAT-6, and the culture filtrate protein, or CFP10. So this is where a quantiferon comes in. So this is one that you're gonna, this is the one that we do for um, new, new hires. So people that are just getting onboarded, we no longer do the TST, we do quantiferon, so it's blood tests for our, all of our new hires. Um, but this is also one that you 
might be ordering for patients who you're suspecting who could potentially have TB. Um, so gamma release assays may be preferred in patients with a history of the Bacille Calmegaran vaccine, which can be administered for therapy for bladder cancer or vaccination, and on those unlikely to return for reading if a TST is administered. So you know, with onboarding being such a quick process now, it's just much easier for us to 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 do the quantiferon. So interferon gamma release assays are more specific. They tend to be, this is true or false, this is true or false. Interferon gamma release assays are more specific. They tend to be more expensive and can still have occasional false, false positive results. As some organisms like the following, it's too many, can have ESAT-6 and CFP10, which induce release of interferon measured by these assays. Is this true or false? Okay, we've got some responses. Yes, this is true. This is true. All right, our Bacille Calmet Garan vaccination. So BCG is an attenuated strain of Mycobacterium bovis that is given as a live bacterial vaccine to prevent the development of active TB. Studies of BCG have shown a wide range of effectiveness from zero to 80%. Areas where TB is highly endemic, BCG vaccination is probably an effective strategy in reducing severe cases of TB, especially in children. BCG vaccination may induce an induration on a TST. The degree to which it does wanes with time. This is important. This sentence is important. Current recommendations in the United States are to interpret TST results without considering BCG vaccination status because a positive test is much more likely to represent latent TB than to represent an unusually strong BCG reaction. BCG is not recommended in most healthcare professionals or healthcare providers in the United States, given its unproven efficacy to prevent TB in adults. Now, one of the things that you need to remember is it really depends on the setting and where you're working and the population that you're working with, because if you're gonna be working primarily with TB patients, those recommendations may change. All right, so true or false? BCG is safe and can be given to HIV infected or otherwise severely immunocompromised persons. Is this true or false? Okay, so. Very good. The majority of you are putting false. False. That is false. Okay. For those of you who know Dwight Schrute, <laughs> that is false. Okay. Because it's a live attenuated vaccine. Okay. So contraindications. This is from CDC. BCG vaccinations should not be given to persons who are immunosuppressed. So those are persons who are infected with HIV or who are likely to become immunocompromised, persons who are candidates for organ transplant. And there's lots of other, you know, categories. This is not just it, but immunosuppression. No, no, no. Because it is a live attenuated vaccine. When you get to occupational health, occupational health, there you, you have an entire section on occupational health on this test. You have to know the differences of your vaccines and which ones are live attenuated, period, point blank. You need to know which vaccines are live attenuated because Civic loves to ask you about contraindications when it comes to live attenuated vaccines. And you have to remember that when you have live attenuated vaccines in immunosuppressed patients, there is the possibility of reverting to the wild type and causing all sorts of issues for those patients. So you have to remember your live attenuated vaccines. Pregnancy, BCG vaccination should not be given during pregnancy, even though no harmful effects of BCG vaccination on the fetus have been observed. Further studies are needed to prove its safety. And then this is what they say. So this is um, BCG live, FDA, you can, the FDA, it's the live package insert. Um, BCG contains live attenuated mycobacteria. Again, it's that mycobacterium bovis. Because of the potential risk for transmission, it should be prepared, handled, and disposed of as a biohazard material. See precautions and dosage and administration. B 
BCG infections have been reported in healthcare workers primarily from exposures resulting from accidental needle sticks or skin lacerations during the preparation of BCG for administration. Nosocomial infections have been reported in patients receiving parenteral drugs that were prepared in areas in which BCG was reconstituted. BCG is capable of dissemination when administered by the intravesical route, and serious infections, including fatal infections, have been reported in patients receiving intravesical BCG. So, this is serious, people. This is serious. Tuberculosis transmission. Are we getting closer to the questions? Please let me look because we have so many questions. Yes, we're getting closer to the questions. Excellent. Okay. Persons at risk of TB infection include those who have close contact with pulmonary or laryngeal TB cases in contact for days or weeks, foreign-born persons within five years of arrival to the United States, residents and employees in crowded settings, um, healthcare personnel, some underserved or low-income populations, and infants exposed to high-risk adults. Source patients at increased risk of TB transmission include those with cough, cavitations on chest x-ray, positive smears, laryngeal or pulmonary TB involvement, failure to cover mouth when coughing, inappropriate, which by the way, this is still happening, right? <laughs> hmm. Okay, inappropriate use of TB medications and those that undergo aerosol generating procedures such as bronchoscopies. The next one is gonna be environmental factors such as TB exposures in closed spaces, inadequate ventilation, air recirculation, poor management of specimens and inadequate cleaning of reusable medical equipment that may contribute to transmission. So several outbreaks have been associated with recirculated air. These include not only healthcare settings, but also naval ships, school buses, classrooms, and bars. Okay, so our prevention of TB. So prevention of tuberculosis is based on detection of cases, airborne isolation, inappropriate negative pressure rooms, respiratory etiquette, use of N95 respirators, and early and complete treatment of tuberculosis cases based on susceptibility testing. So this breaks down some of the differences when it comes to um, recommendations from CDC and the WHO for preventing TB transmission in healthcare settings. We don't have enough time to go through them. So let's start going through some questions. We're gonna have to go through these quickly, okay? Because it's almost the end. I can't believe it, but it, it is. We're almost done today. Okay, so scenario is Samuel is a healthy 45-year-old male with no significant past medical history. He recently visited South Africa with his wife on a one-week vacation. He starts his new job as a nurse in an LTAC two days after returning from his trip. Samuel completed his PPD test upon hire approximately three weeks before his trip, which was negative. As the employee health nurse, do you have any concerns with this result? You can type yes, you can type no, you can type maybe so. And so the the answer to this question is going to vary by your facility policy because different facilities are going to have different policies in place for what they're going for what they're going to for what they're going to want and it's also going to vary you know and I this is just this is just a conversation starter it's not you know it's not like an actual test question or anything but it's also going to depend on what um what type of activities Samuel was on. I mean, it's very different if he goes to a resort in South Africa versus, oh, I spent, you know, I spent a week volunteering in a tuberculosis, tuberculosis clinic, right? And so um, it, it, it's really going to, it's really going to depend on what your facility policy says. And additionally, there, the PPD test was before the trip. So if anything, so if anything, right, you, you as the staff member would just want to make sure that you notify employee health and that you let them know X, Y, and Z. Um, but they, okay, so we've got lots of different answers. Um, no, I wouldn't be concerned. It would be captured on an annual TST or a chest x-ray. Um, we don't typically read tests after trips to high-risk countries. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different, there's lots of different um, thought processes, but that's just to get your, your your brain working. All right, let's go through these questions. We gotta go. We gotta go quick. 
So just go with what your gut is telling you on these. Okay, so number one, the optimal time to collect a sputum specimen for an acid fast bacilli testing to rule out TB would be A, first thing in the morning, B, after respiratory therapy treatment, C, prior to the patient going to bed, or D, prior to a respiratory treatment. Excellent, excellent. For those of you who said A, first thing in the morning, you are correct. When a patient with AIDS is admitted with possible pneumonia, the physician who is a general practitioner orders airborne isolation. What is the correct response? A, a TST skin test should be placed to determine if the patient may have TB. B, a sputum specimen should be collected for AFB daily times three if TB is suspected. C, if the chest radiograph is clear, isolation can be discontinued. Or D, PCP is not transmitted person to person and does not require isolation. <laughs> I think it should be TB is not transmitted person to person. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got a lot of different questions here. Sorry, a lot of different answers, not questions. We've got a lot of different answers. Oh, that usually means that we are not all in a similar page. Okay. Every answer choice is, every answer choice was selected. A, B, C, and D. All right. You have to remember that when it comes to um, our TSTs, it's counting on an immune response, right? Um, and so th that that that's not going to be the it's not going to be the best the best method to do this because you know because the patient is immunocompromised, um, and the patient's immunocompromised. So if you're if a patient's coming in with pneumonia, if TB is suspected, right? If the if the provider places this person on airborne isolation and TB is suspected, then you have to have those sputum specimens collected for AFB daily times three if you're suspecting it, okay? Um, the chest radiograph is clear. I, guys, we talked about this, right? If you're immunocompromised, are you gonna have those cavitary lesions? Mm, no, you may not, you may not. It really depends. And we know that when a patient has progressed to AIDS, they're, they're counts are low, you know, it's below 200, there's there's just, yeah, okay, so we need to clarify this up a little bit because we had a lot of, we had a lot of different answer choices. People with HIV are at high risk for developing TB. If TB is suspected, the patient should be placed in airborne isolation and a sputum specimen for AFB should be collected times three. All right, question number three, which of the following statements is false regarding influenza viruses? Um, this is because we had flu in here, um, not in the lecture, but for the week. So A, they are divided into three categories, A, B, and C. B, influenza A strains have been the predominant cause of worldwide epidemics um, and pandemics. C, influenza A and B strains have been named according to the city or state and year of their initial isolation. And D, influenza B strains have not been associated with large epidemics. Which of the following statements is false? False regarding influenza viruses. That means that there's three things up on the screen that are true. Yep, so the false statement is gonna be influenza B strains have not been associated with large epidemics. Um, this A, B, and C are all true. All right, question four. A patient with rust-colored sputum, malaise, weight loss, and fatigue is admitted to the medical center from a long-term care facility. The doctor orders sputum for AFB smear and culture, fungal and bacterial cultures. A chest radiograph shows right upper lobe infiltrates. The patient has a negative PPD and one sputum specimen is smear negative. What, what do we need to do? A, isolation should continue. B, isolation can be discontinued after the second sputum smear is negative. C, the patient can be removed from isolation because he does not have TB. And D, isolation can be discontinued after he has been on antibiotics for 24 hours.
Very good. Okay, this feels good. Everyone got A. Or the I only see A's up right now. I don't know if there was something before that, but our rationale for patients placed under airborne precautions because of suspected infectious TB disease of the lungs, airway, or larynx, airborne precautions can be discontinued when infectious TB disease is considered unlikely. And either another diagnosis is made that explains the clinical syndrome, or the patient produces three consecutive negative sputum smears collected in eight to 24 hour intervals. One should be an early morning specimen. Okay, question five. The validity of a culture report is dependent on the quality of the specimen sent. To determine if an expectorated specimen was sputum and not saliva, the gram stain should show. And I don't wanna confuse you guys, so I'll let you read it and then type in your answer. All right, really good. Yes, yes. Fewer than, a lot of you are putting D. Fewer than 10 epithelial cells per low power field. Our rationale is useful sputum culture results rely heavily on good sample collection. If examination of a gram stain of the sample reveals that it contains a significant number of squamous epithelial cells, those that line the mouth, then the sample is not generally considered adequate for culture and a recollection of the sample may be required. If the sample contains a majority of white blood cells, neutrophils, that indicates a body's response to an infection, then it is considered to be an adequate sample for culturing. All right, question six. An IP is a designated person at a large tertiary care facility who must conduct a risk assessment of the entire facility and implement an appropriate tuberculosis infection control program. This assessment should include all of the following except A, reviewing the community tuberculosis profile, B, results of the healthcare worker's tuberculosis skin test, C, reviewing drug susceptibility patterns, or D, results of data from the hospital in the next region. So this assessment should include all of the following except very good for those of you <laughs> some of you kept changing your answers but for those of you who put d that is correct What's our rationale? The incidence of tuberculosis varies geographically from region to region. The assessment of risk should be based on local incidence. All right, question seven. An IP provided an in-service to healthcare workers concerning risks of tuberculosis transmission. A week later, the IP notices a nurse who was among those recently taught, propping the door open <laughs> to a negative pressure room. How should the IP address this problem? A, check the attendance. You know, this is like the realest question that has come through. Like 10 out of 10. A, check the attendance records to verify this nurse's attendance at the recent in-service. B, report this to the unit head nurse and instructor to handle the situation. <laughs> rich. C, schedule another in-service. Or D, provide one-on-one -on -one education emphasizing each, each employee's role in preventing HAIs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, okay. It looks like everyone is saying D and yes. So you definitely wanna provide that one-on-one -on -one education and you wanna find out what's what's going on. So one of the things that our patient experience uh, manager here always tells me is, she says, Luz, first you have to seek to understand. And you know, thank you, Leah, because you are constantly in my brain. When I see something that just does not make sense to me, like someone walking into a room without wearing their gowns on, someone, you know, first you have to seek to understand what's the issue, what's the problem? What are we missing here? Did did they not understand something? Did they, it, was there a language barrier? Could we have, you know, 
first seek to understand because it really helps to develop those, um, you know, that those that communication with your frontline staff. So one-to-one -one education allows for mutual problem solving, permitting satisfactory outcome for both parties. You know, maybe they that person didn't have uh, enough help trying to get some, you know, some things into that room. I don't know. There could be lots of different things, but first seek to understand. So question number eight, a new employee requests to not have a man to test because she previously received the bastille calmegrin vaccine while living abroad. Which of the following should the IP recommend? A, an annual chest x-ray. B, the annual man two, unless positive. C, prophylactic INH for six months. Or D, restriction from duty until seen by a TB specialist. I'm not getting a lot of answers for this one. Aren't most places doing quantiferons? Yeah, I think most places are, but what if it, it, the the quantiferons are more expensive tests? What if you're a, you know, um, rural hospital? What if this is the, the, the thing that you're using? Hmm, okay. Lots of different questions. I'm sorry, answers. I keep messing my words up today. So B, annual man two test unless positive. So the tuberculin skin test and blood tests to detect TB infection are not contraindicated for persons who have been vaccinated with BCG. Current recommendations in the United States are to interpret TST results without considering BCG vaccination status because a positive test is much more likely to represent latent TB than to represent an unusually strong BCG reaction. So um, somebody said, I work corrections. We use the PPD. See, there's lots of different reasons why a place may not be choosing to use the quantiferon and maybe and may using our protein, our purified protein derivative testing. All right, question nine, we're almost done. Um, if you have to go, that's okay, but we're almost done. So in reviewing microbiology reports as part of surveillance activities, it is important for the IP to know which of the following regarding sputum specimen results. A, review of routine sputum culture results may be an effective and efficient means to conduct surveillance for unusual reportable respiratory infections, such as Bordetella pertussis, Legionella, and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. B, a microbiological report that includes information regarding the method of specimen collection provides greater predictability in depicting etiologic agents. C, a summary of positive sputum culture reports for a specified period of time may provide an excellent overview of respiratory pathogens. And D, only final sputum cultures can provide definitive information regarding lower respiratory infection pathogens. So this is in reviewing our microbiology reports. It is important for the IP to know which of the following regarding sputum specimen results. So I've received A as an answer, D as an answer, and that's it. <laughs> so I think people are really thinking about this one. This is a hard one. but this test is not easy. So it's good to get used to some of these types of questions. Okay, so we have A, D, and B that have been selected. And the one that's winning is A. Okay, so the correct answer is A, sorry, the correct answer is B, a microbiological report that includes information regarding the method of specimen collection provides greater predictability in depicting ideologic agents. So for our rationale, these is why, this is why A and the other ones were not the correct answer. So A was not correct because these organisms require specialized techniques for laboratory diagnosis and would not be identified in routine culture. C is incorrect because sputum culture results commonly yield contaminant or colonizing organisms rather than etiologic agents. 
D was incorrect because Gramstein results provide valuable information to distinguish between adequate and inadequate sputum samples by evaluating the presence of squamous epithelial cells and leukocytes. And B is the correct answer because the method of specimen collection, such as expectorated sputum, tracheostomy aspiration, bronchoscopy, lung biopsy, provides important information regarding the likelihood of the results representing oropharyngeal flora versus the etiologic pathogen of a lower respiratory infection. Question 10. The IP is notified that environmental service workers were observed not using TB respirators upon entering a TB isolation room. Educational records show classes were provided three weeks prior to the reported observations. The IP should do which of the following? A, respond that this is not an educational issue. B, assess the appropriateness of the teaching method used. C, provide for counseling of policy violators. <laughs> D, com complete incident, it should say complete incident reports for risk management. Complete incident reports for risk management. Very good, everyone's putting B. Yes, we wanna assess the appropriateness of the teaching method we used. Um, we, we may have used a method that was not good for that population. You have to be able as an infection preventionist to adjust your teaching styles because you can't provide the same presentation that you would provide to a nurse that, we, that you would provide to EVS or our nutritional services. Um, I mean, you have to, there's so much data on educational backgrounds, understanding. Maybe there was a different way that you could have um, portray that information and again first seek to understand what where is the gap where's the gap what what do we need to fix question 11 what is the most common type of adverse reaction when undergoing treatment for tb a is impairment of visual acuity b is nephrotoxicity c is pancreatitis and d is hepatotoxicity Okay, for those of you who put D, very good job. So, patients started on therapy should have a baseline aspirate, amino transferase, or AST, a visual acuity, and a color vision check. While on therapy, patients should be monitored clinically for drug toxicity. Hepatotoxicity, which is, affects your liver, is the most common adverse reaction, okay? And then they go in and talk about some of the other drugs. Okay, we are going to finish today. All right, so next week is week four. And all of these chapters are really important, so I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna tell you what to read, what not to read. Um, but you, let me tell you something: you will get questions on hepatitis, and you will get questions on Legionella, and you will get questions on Enterobacteriaceae and diarrheal diseases. So pick your struggle this weekend. <laughs> Um, I would recommend viral hepatitis because I think they all, they just love asking you about hepatitis. Uh, they love asking you about your core antigen, your core antibodies. They, they want to make sure you understand the structure of the virus, interpretation of lab results. There's so much that you need to know for hepatitis. So, um, and Legionella is important. These are all really fun organisms to learn about and to read about. There is still a lot of information in regards to TB that you need to know that we we were not able to cover and that unfortunately because of just the amount of information that they provide you have to read these chapters it's not enough to listen in on Fridays you got to do your readings this is all supplemental right you can't just come on Fridays and then think I'm going to pass my test because I am not the APIC text I can't bestow all of this information upon you. I try to do my best, and again, this is a passion project, and I do this to try to help people prepare for the test, but you still have to put in a lot of work on your end um, and make sure you're doing your readings. Hopefully, for those of you who enjoy schedules and enjoy assignments and some a little bit of structure, this is helping you in getting your studying done. And for those of you who are gonna be taking your test soon, good luck. You guys are gonna do amazing, um, but that is it for today. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now. And if you have any questions, um, I'll stay on for maybe another two, three minutes to make sure I can answer them. But thank you guys. Have a good have a good weekend.